Uh, thanks very much, folks. I have a mental picture of a load of people sitting in the sun here, ready to enjoy the next hour or so uh, and enjoy the good weather. So I hope that's how we're trying to start off. Um, James Devan is my name, Games Development Manager with Leinster GA and have been for coming up on five years now. Um, I'm joined today by Anya McNamara. Anya has two roles, one being in the academic uh, world. She's recently taken up a role in DCU and previous to that was working in the UK. The other side of her, role, of her job sees her work with a company called Grey Matters Performance, which works across a range of sports um, and I suppose everything that that, that that entails around talent development, working with, with NGBs and, and trying to improve what they're doing. So in 20, what we're going to talk about today is, is a tourist program that we have and Anya will, will supplement, I suppose, the, the academic thinking behind it and how it's come to fruition and how it's practically been rolled out around the province. Um, since 2017, when we, we sat down a, a, as an office and as a team, we sat down to kind of see, could we create a, a support program for our coaches working around the province? A little bit different to what we had previous to it. I'll just set the scene as to what challenges we faced or what our scenario was. So we 550 clubs in Leinster. So that's going everywhere from Loud right down to Wexford, and they come in all shapes and sizes, as you can imagine. Some will be large urban clubs that have one GPO um, assigned to them and working with them every day, day in, day out. Others would be small rural clubs um, that we maybe would have a GDA or a GPO working that would also have on his work or his or her workload to cover 13 or 14 other clubs. So our range is huge in how we engage with our coaches. We know that we've 30,000 plus formal uh, education attendees since 2009 to 2019. So led by Colin Clear, working closely with, with Peter in Crow Park, we've had huge attendances in our formal coach education program. So that told us that we have a huge thirst for knowledge out there and we have a huge engagement with club coaches like all the people on this webinar this evening that just want to be better coaches. So we know that we're catering for them through the formal coach ed. And again, why we came back to tourists was maybe to offer a slight alternative to that as well. And then finally then, we've 100 staff trained as coach developers. So we've quite a strong workforce uh, around the province of Leinster. And we've got really, really good staff. So we also have to bear in mind, what did we have and what was our reach? So with 100 people, we've quite a huge range of reach uh, into these clubs. So we wanted again to provide as good a program as we could. So we just move it on there, on you. Um, second yeah. So three further things to consider was what was coming from the ground. And, and when we speak to our staff, the big thing that we hear, um, and again, maybe many people on this call have said the same thing, what do we need to be doing at each age group? So we'll get the big question, where should my under eight be? Where should my under 13 be? Where should my under 15 be? So it's all about age specific coaching and where our players should be and how we can help coaches achieve that. So that was a big method, a big factor in why we sat down to create this program. I've talked about our big numbers and formal coach Ed and they're massive. Um, but I suppose the big thing for us is the aftercare beyond that. So currently in our foundation course, there's no requirement to engage beyond that. Uh, and we always get a great response during the course. We know that people go home in twos but we'd love to know what's that like six months later? What's that like a year later? What's it like two years later? And, and have, have our coaches put into practice what they've picked up in our courses. So we like that element of engaging with our coaches. And further to that, we want to engage them in their club setting. So I guess we've all been there on the practical side of courses. And if we're being honest, we've got to raise the question is, is it a little bit artificial of, a, of an environment? Do we really see people coaching and all that that involves with, 30 kids arriving at your training session and how do we handle that as a coach? So we, we like to, to add that to this program as well of getting into clubs. We've one simple aim as coach developers in creating tourists as a coach development program. And that was just to support coaches. So that's what we wanted to do. Our number one requirement is to support coaches. And we've tried to do that across, across a range of ideas. Resources, number one. So people want resources. If people go to courses, the one thing they'll say is, you know, drills, activities, games, can you give us something that we can go away with? So we do accept that, that, that we have to provide that thirst and, and look after people for that. So we've created a huge range of resources that we'll make available to anyone on this call to, today. Uh, I'll talk to them uh, as, as, the, as the day goes on. 
I've, one of our biggest challenges is that our players um, are involved in, of course, a range of teams. And that means a range of coaches. So we took the view of looking at the coaches uh, across these our three main areas. So our players in the middle of these circles, our footballers and hurlers. Firstly, we know they're in clubs. We know they're in a club environment because that's where we really get our first engagement as a player. Possibly some are in academy squads and we, and we would like to help our coaches in that programme as well. And we know that all our kids go to school. So teachers in both primary and post-primary have a big role. But what this programme seeks to do, and this image is very strong in it, is it, we look to put the players at the centre of everything we do. And by doing that, we look to cater for the coaches in the different areas. So quickly taking them across the clubs. This is probably our primary focus and, and we, of where we can engage with these people the most. We're all about putting the club at the centre in this, uh, this programme and working with our club coaches. We probably have more time with our academy squad coaches. So anyone working in games development will, will see these people quite regularly. So across 14s, 15s, 16s, 17s, we've got a great opportunity to engage with these with these people more often than we probably do at the club setting because there's less of them. It's county based, which allows a number of people to work with these coaches. So we bear that in mind as well, that academy squad coaches, we would have to provide maybe a little bit extra and dig down a little bit deeper. And I'll talk you through how we've done that later on. And finally then in the school environment, it's probably a little bit more challenging. So in a primary school, it's very much what our guys do day in, day out, where they might have that 40 minute session. And we've asked them to, to put on a slightly different hat to leave something behind. So when you go in to take a session, you're as much a coach developer with that primary school teacher as you are a coach to those kids. And then at post primary school level, we see this as a critical part of our player pathway. And it, it's very often a, a quite a competitive environment. And um, it's very often a, a knockout environment. It's an environment where maybe coach development or player development can take a back seat because of the competitions that we put in front of these people. So we'd like to work with those teachers maybe at a different angle to what we've done previously and try and be more of a coach developer to them, which we've probably failed them in the past. So that allows, that sets the, that sets the scene of what we wanted to do and um, develop coaches across these three areas. Knowing our environment in Leinster was quite a large scale, but also knowing we had quite a lot of staff. Um, so we set about creating resources and then we were fortunate enough to uh, be introduced to Anya and the work she does and Anya is going to set the scene now of kind of what, what she envisaged in coming to us, the background that she would, would like to bring to us and then we'll come back in together how we merged our two worlds and what the tourist programme looks like now and, and rather than you just sit and listen to what tourist is, we'll also try and maybe to use a word you're going to hear later on is test and challenge your coaching this evening and see maybe the areas you feel you could develop and maybe we can take from beyond tonight into real coach development with yourselves. So I'll hand you over to Anya now to set the scene on her background and her input into the programme. Brilliant. So thanks a million, uh, James. And I'll just talk a little bit around how what what we were doing at the start and how we came to uh, develop and then refine the Thuris program. And I suppose I, I got involved with Leinster maybe four or five, six years ago. And one of the things that I think has been really good has been the slow progress that we've made in a way in Thurs in that Leinster were really keen to make sure that there was real evidence base underpinning the coach development program that they had. So they had resources, they have lots of coaches and God, they have loads of players. So they wanted to make sure that the changes they were going to make to coach education were evidence based and that there was kind of a research um, foundation to, towards that. And like James said, the coach, the Thurs Coach Education Programme we're, we're going to talk about today is very much based around the idea we use a hashtag called better coaches make better players. So the better we can develop coaches in your clubs and in your schools and in your counties, God, they're going to influence hundreds and hundreds of, of young players as they transition through, through the pathway. So by focusing on that development of coaches and recognising that we need really excellent coaches at all levels of the pathway. It gave us a kind of a foundation to, to help us understand what would that look like and what's the evidence underpinning the experience that we want to give young players on the pathway. And I suppose my background is as a PE teacher, as a coach and as a kind of a youth sport coach educator. And I, I always knew that coaching was important. And I always knew that sport was important. And like you can see in this picture, it was really only when I started having kids and when those kids started getting involved in sport that I recognised that the foundation or the grassroots of the of the pathway was absolutely vital. Um, 
but that it's goddamn, it's really hard and it's really challenging and it's really complex, you know. So almost it's easier to go out and coach a bunch of senior intercounty players. But, you know, on a Saturday morning when I have 50 nursery kids waiting to learn how to hurl, that can be really complex and challenging, but it's really important because that first experience that kids get in sport can either turn them on or turn them off to, to sport for the rest of their lives. So we really recognise that and we wanted to make sure that we empowered coaches to provide young kids and players all the way through right into adult grade uh, sport with a really enriching and effective environment that helped them reach their potential in sport. And I suppose there's a couple of kind of background things that kind of helped our understanding of what that program would look like. And the first was what would the experience at early stages, especially, but actually throughout the pathway look like for young players? And two things come to mind here. One is, and lots of people are probably familiar with some of the research that's coming out at the moment, especially from an Irish perspective. Uh, Stephen Bean up in DCU has recently published stuff that says, you know, more than half of kids get to secondary school without the basic movement skills that they need to stay involved in sport and physical activity. So they can't, they don't have their basic running, jumping, locomotion, catching and throwing skills to, to get involved in sport and then maintain their involvement through their, through their pathway. And it's interesting, though, because if I go down to my local hurling club or my local hockey club, some kids, even when they're involved in a sporting pathway, don't have those fundamental skills as well. So a really important question for us was how could we make sure that early experiences in GA would be structured to give kids the skills that they would need to, and I'll use a GA phrase, to stay and play in the game, to maintain their involvement along the pathway. And that kind of brought up two sort of conundrums. One was there's a real drive at the moment to, with this kind of mantra of we need to make the game fun and just let kids play. And I suppose it's a bit of a backlash uh, against the, the drive for really organised sport. And we look back to our childhood and we were running around and playing. And we were just chatting before and we came on. And a real positive of the last nine weeks of COVID is my six and four year olds spend lots of time outside and they spend lots of time hurling and football and playing hockey and playing soccer and playing rugby. And they're given a chance just to play. But actually just letting kids play isn't the most effective way to get them uh, the skills that they need to develop further into their into the pathway. So one of the things that we know is that early activities have to be fun but they also have to emphasize the fundamental skills that young people need to maintain their involvement. Um, so what we'll talk about during the, the kind of the Thuris program is how we make sure that we organize our coaching so that kids develop the physical skills, the psychomotor skills, and the confidence and resilience that you heard John Horan talk about that helps them stay involved in sport. The other thing is we really want when we're thinking about how we coach kids, we, we wanted to go back to, to understanding actually why do kids stay in sport? Why do kids come back Saturday after Saturday? And I'll be probably honest, I'll go around the country and I'll watch my kids play on a Saturday and they want to go back the next Saturday. And sometimes I'm a bit confused because the training session didn't look that much fun. There was lots of lines. They don't seem to be getting any better. The coach didn't seem that enthusiastic. Uh, they didn't seem to be having lots of laughs and lots of enjoyment. So actually, are we sure we're offering kids all the, as much as possible, a really positive environment to learn the skills to stay and play in the game? So one of the things that we know is that staying um, involved in sport is underpinned by kind of four really big things. It's underpinned with, by actual competence. So kids will play sport, will play, um, do physical activity if they have the skills to be able to engage it. So if I can catch, if I can run, if I can hop, if I can skip, if I can um, strike a ball, then I have some of the actual competence to be able to go and play hurling, to play football, to play rounders, to do whatever it is. So we have to make sure in terms of coaching that we really get those kind of fundamental skills down early but actually that we reinforce them the whole way through the pathway. So fundamental skills aren't a nursery thing in your club. They're a thing that we have to reinforce right the way through, probably to adulthood. The other thing is, is it's all very well being having the actual competence to do something. The other thing that we have to do when we coach is we have to ensure that kids have perceived competence. They believe in their ability to do it because the mix between actually doing it and being confident in my ability to do it and 
recognize that I, I can give things a go is really, really important. And especially for those of you who might be coaching, you know, uh, preteen and teenagers, that's a real dropout age. You know, people tend to drop out of sport. And why do they drop out? Because they're not good enough. They don't have the opportunities to, to give things a go and they lack the confidence to do it. So if we know they're the reasons why kids drop out of sport, our coaching has to make sure that we kind of, we emphasize that before the crisis happens. So we inoculate kids against that challenge before they get there. And then, then, and then we give them opportunities to play and we'll talk a bit about how those principles work. And the fourth kind of reason kids kind of stay in sport and uh, John Doyle from Kildare, I'll steal his line. He talked about his dad told him to just stick with it. You know, if you're going around, if you're on a team, it doesn't matter if you're number one on the team or number 20, you just keep coming back. And if we can instill that stick with itness and that confidence and that resilience in young players, then they're much more likely to, to, to maintain their involvement. And we have to think then when we're working in our clubs, especially, you know, we have huge numbers in our nurseries and our under eights and under tens and under twelves. But suddenly that, that pyramid starts to get a bit narrower as we get older. And we have to think, are we giving kids the experiences they need and the skills that they need to maintain that involvement throughout adolescence and adulthood? And it's interesting because I guess if we're saying those things are important, I often ask coach going to clubs across sports and I ask coaches, you know, to tell me, are they successful or who's the most successful club or coach in their club? And a lot of the time they'll go, oh, John's really good. He won the Fela last year or, you know, Peter's really good. They got to the minor championship. And we often think about what good is against short term, what happened this season. But actually, that depends about what level you're coaching at. So actually, if I'm coaching for the under sixes or under tens or under sixteens, yes, I want to win. And look, I'm really competitive and I want to win stuff. But I have to recognize that the way I coach now is going to have repercussions for where that kid goes to in a couple of years time. So when we're talking about coaching, especially kids on the pathway and young adults on the pathway, we really have to be concerned about the long term success, about the senior success and, see, and probably more importantly, retention of those players. And that, that helps, me, helps me guide the decisions I make about how I coach. So if you look here in the slide, if I look at early success, I really want to win the Fela. So I'm, I'm going to win Fela 2021. What will I do? How will I organize my, my sessions? I'll have lots of competition. I'll go, yeah, we're back on the pitch in September. We're going to keep training out uh, over the winter. I'll have an SNC program for my under 14s so that will kick in. I'll tell them not to go and play Junior Cup Rugby in their school and to come and just do hurling. We'll have lots of high intensity. We'll have a pretty narrow squad. So if you're not if you're not on that team, you're not training with us. And we'll make lots of these coaching decisions that might win us the failure. All of those things are positively associated with early success. But actually then if we track that team six or eight years down the line, they're rarely the ones who are successful. Because across sports, what we see is that early, early specialization, playing one sport, high intensity of training, high um, training volume, training lots, and emphasizing early success gets you a win early, but is rarely uh, related to senior success. And I don't think anyone on the call will argue that what you want in your environment is kids playing for longer and playing, uh, and more kids playing for longer. So that's what we kind of want to look at in the, other, in the purple and the green box here. If we're looking for senior success, we let kids play lots of sports. We let them, you know, play rugby, play hockey, go to athletics. They might miss training sessions in hurling and football, but that's OK because they're going to come back to us as better players. We'll, we don't worry about the intensity of the training. We certainly don't worry about the volume of the training. And in fact, lots of those things have a negative correlation with, with senior success. The more you do some of this stuff early, the less likely you're going to be successful later on. So that gives us gives us an idea about some of the coaching decisions that we should make when we go back, hopefully in the next next couple of months onto a pitch about how we organize the sessions and the decisions we make about who plays, how they play and um, the emphasis that we put on. But of course, winning is important. We want to succeed. But the whole idea is as youth coaches, we want to we want to win, but we want to win in developmental terms by doing the right thing. And an overemphasis on that early can lead us down the wrong path for later on in terms of dropout, in terms of long term engagement. 
And that's interesting because if we're thinking about developing players, which is what Thuris is about, and we purposefully chose that name Thuris because it means journey. Um, so we're talking about the player's journey and the coach's journey, and we want people to be on that journey for as long as possible. And developing young players is a marathon, not a sprint. And I, I'm guessing lots of people are, are familiar with what's called the relative age effect. So if I go into uh, Leash under 14s or Dublin minors or, or Cork Mogie under minor team, and I look at people's date of births, much a uh, higher percentage of those kids are going to be born in the first couple of months of the selection year. So if the cutoff date is 1st of January, those teams are overpopulated by kids that are born in January and February, and less kids are on that team that are born in December and uh, November. So this, this idea of these, these two um, circles here. And why does that happen? It doesn't happen because something miraculous happened nine months before January that got these kids good at hurling at football. It happened because those kids born in the first quarter of the selection year are usually physically more mature, have usually had more um, coaching opportunities, so they look good early. They look like the real deal because they're physically able, they're physically more mature than these poor kids who might be almost a year younger than them in this age group. But what's really interesting though, is that that's the age that they came into the Dublin under 14s, for example. But then we go and look at a senior team and we don't generally see that effect. In fact, what we see is that kids born at the end of the selection year, so the relatively younger kids, have a better chance of being successful adults. Kids born in the start of the selection year have less of a chance of being successful adults. And that really got myself and the, the people I do research with got us thinking, why would that happen? What happens in the coaching and development environment that leads to that, that outcome? And one of the things that we figure is that coach, this is, the first quarter kids are pretty badly coached. Early on, they get by because they're physically able, they get by because they're physically stronger than their, than their peers, and often coaching and often competition allows them to be successful because of that. But they don't develop the range of skills that allow them to be good, successful adults. They don't, and especially when their peers um, uh, start to kind of um, match them or surpass them in terms of physical characteristics. So the, the message for, for me here is actually we have to make sure that we give lots of kids development opportunities that allow them to develop the actual competence, being good at a range of skills and the confidence to stick with it. And if we do that, we'll get much more kids out of the pathway and into adult uh, level competition. And that's also interesting because this slide looks looks kind of complicated, but it's not. And but what it's telling us is that we have to consider the type of activities that we get in. And look, I'm I'm like lots of people probably on the call. I'll get kids in and they're on my hurling team or they're on my hockey team or they're on whatever. And I want to do loads of that activity with them because I want them to get good quickly. So we'll do a very sport specific training program like this big straight line that you see here. But actually that big straight line doesn't give kids the breadth of activities that they need and doesn't give them the range of skills that they need to be good later on. Even more importantly, for those of you on the call who are working with young, um, young adults or teenage players, a really important thing happens during that, that playing span. They grow, they go into puberty, they get injured, they have a growth spurt. So what we really need to do when we're coaching kids, we need to give them a range of activities and we need to make sure we look at the fundamental skills all the way through the pathway. So when we do lots of hurling and football stuff here, then we do lots of general stuff or we let them go and play lots of different sports. Then we do hurling and football stuff and then we do more general stuff or lots of other sports, etc. So we're bulletproofing them against the, the kind of the challenges that they're going to face on the pathway. It might slow down progress here as a 13, 14 and 15 year old in hurling or in football but it will give us a much better product at the end because that's what we're interested in. We're interested in this player's thirst, their journey, and how we can equip them towards that kind of final destination of where they're going to go. So that's the below the next stuff. Like you heard John Horan say as well, we're interested in developing the player and we're interested in developing better players. 
And we're also interested in developing players with the psychological skills, if you like, to be able to stay in the game, to be able to cope with the challenges of playing sport and to be able to cope with the challenges that are outside sport that influence their involvement as well. Just the general kind of challenge of adolescence, teenage years, school, university, other commitments. And over the last 10 or 12 years, I've been involved in a piece of work that looks at what are those psychological characteristics that young players need to be able to maintain their progress in sport. And we've come up with a list and we call them PCDEs or psychological characteristics of developing excellence. And what we say is that these 10 characteristics, these 10 skills, if we can teach young players those skills as part of being a hurling coach and as part of being a football coach or a camogie coach, then we're equipping them with the skills to be able to, be, to maximise their potential. So the same way that we would develop hurling, striking, kicking, catching, we would also, as part and parcel of our coaching, develop these psychological skills. And like James will talk about later, when we implement the, the Thurs principles into our coaching, we'd often have a coaching plan that would have a PCD outcome. So, you know, today we're going to, our session's about, you know, striking, it's about striking for distance and it's about teamwork, but we're also going to have something in there about goal setting and self-reinforcement. So as part of being a good coach, you're looking above the neck and below the neck in terms of the skills that young players need to get there. Because these are the, if you remember back, perceived competence, actual competence, confidence and give it a go-ness. These are the skills that underpin young players' confidence and their their likelihood to give give sport a go and challenge themselves to, to get better at it. So I'll go back to kind of what I touched on a little bit ago, because it's a really hot topic, I guess, and a, a pretty contentious topic in the role of competition uh, and the role of competition in young players' diet. And I think every time I go and I talk and I, I go into clubs all the time and every time I go in, we have lots of these great conversations, but inevitably someone, you know, when we get to the question and answer, will go, oh yeah, what are your thoughts about Fela? What are your thoughts about Tony Forrestal? What are your thoughts about academy squads? Because competition is is integral to how we organise sport, but it can be both an enabler and a derailer of participation and development. When competition is used well, it's a fantastic development tool. It's something that helps our players get better. But sometimes co coaching, or sorry, sometimes competition can be used as a real driver of coach coaching decisions. So if you remember back to that slide where we talked about things that are good and not so good about long term development. If winning of, of a competition is really important to me as the under 14 coach, then I'm going to make some coaching decisions. I'm going to play certain type of players, maybe those relatively older players. I might play a style of play that will win me that game, but mightn't actually set up players for the long term. I mightn't play all my bench or I mightn't give them meaningful minutes. And I, I'm therefore, am I really narrowing that experience? If you think about that uh, Christmas tree model I showed a minute ago, too soon for short-term success rather than long-term success. And there's loads of examples, and I use this idea from Dennis Bergkamp and Ajax in, in, in Holland, which is probably touted as one of the, you know, optimum uh, talent development environments in youth soccer. And, you know, it's, a, it's clearly a really competitive environment. Their, their job is to develop uh, professional footballers that, and to sell them to, uh, to other clubs to, fi to finance their own club. But what he says here is really interesting is that sometimes in youth sport you put your strongest player on the bench to let other people shine or you put a right footed player who can't do anything with his left on the left side and force him to use his right foot of course you're probably going to lose when you don't use your strongest player but in the end when the player gets out of that pathway they know how to use their right and left foot they know what it means to be top and bottom of the pecking order and they have understood the range of skills that they need to to make it at the top it might limit your underage success, but it has really positive long term uh, repercussions. But of course, there's all sorts of pressures on us when we coach, even when we're just coaching in our clubs or in uh, at that level in terms of competition. And uh, as a as a bit of a the other end of the spectrum, I, I show this this picture of this Cardiff school a lot where the Cardiff school banned video challenges to their three-legged race because parents were coming in worried why little Johnny didn't get the bronze medal and he was pipped at the line and they had the video. So there's no doubt that people really value winning, but actually we have to understand its place in the pathway. And a nice kind of hurling um, 
example is the Tony Forrestal All Ireland competition. So the Tony Forrestal is an intercounty All Ireland competition at under 14. A couple of years ago, uh, a nice journalist sent me this after I gave a, I gave a talk at a, at a conference, and it shows really interesting. Not one winner of the Tony Forrestal uh, under 14 went on four years later when it was under 18 or three years later when it was under 17 to win that minor championship. So the team that won early in the pathway weren't successful later on in the pathway. And that makes me think of all sorts of things. It makes me think who's doing the right thing. So maybe the teams that didn't win here, the teams that came second, third, fourth, fifth, and were there or thereabouts, were using the competition appropriately to drive their development to get here. On the flip side, maybe the teams that won here, so if I'm Cork in 2013, and I put a lot of emphasis onto that team, onto winning that team. I cut my player base. I worked with my best 22 under 14s. We trained all the time. They didn't play junior cup with CBC. They did all this kind of stuff just to win the Forestal. And I'm not saying that's true. But four years later, that had repercussions about where that minor team were and onto senior as well. Interestingly, that county and some other counties have now pulled out of those sort of competitions because they go, look, that doesn't reflect our developmental needs. We're much better off having in-house competitions that allow us drive our behaviours, that allow us drive our coaching ethos and our philosophy. So I guess for me, the bottom line is that we have to think carefully about how we use competition because competition is absolutely important. Kids want to play. I want to play. We're competitive in our house when we're you know, on the trampoline. We're, we have competitions all the time. We have competitions with a developmental focus. We want competitions that are fun, but we'll talk, you know, what does that mean? It still means they have to be challenging. It has to be, be meaningful. We want competitions that um, emphasize perceived and actual competence. So a competition where lots of kids get on the ball lots of the time. Uh, I was at a local match recently, an uh, under 14 match, and they were training. It was a training game, but they were playing 15 aside, and the poor cornerbacks and corner forwards might as well had a chair pulled up because they never touched the ball. That developmental competition might have been much better as a seven of sides. Gives more people a chance to do stuff more often, have time to learn, to practice, to make mistakes. Lots of touches, lots of decisions, lots of actions. So, so and we'll talk about it later. Often we see a bit of joystick coaching, you know, coaches on the sideline telling players to stand here, do this, do that. How often do we use competition as a time for players to figure stuff out, to have autonomy and independence? We want competitions with degrees of variability. So my local club will go and play James's local club one day because his club is rubbish and we're good and I want to give the, go the boys uh, a bit of a confidence boost. But another day we'll go up and we'll play a club in Dublin that are really good because I want to have a different sort of challenge there. So, or some days I'll play my strongest players in certain positions, I won't play them in other positions, but I want to give them a variable diet of competition to support their development. And I want to give them the, the confidence and the skills needed and the experiences needed to build that confidence in their development. And I, I like this. I, I stole this, this tweet uh, from Twitter last year. And here's a coach that was trying to do all this stuff. He had a competition. He allowed all his team play. Everyone got equal minutes. Everyone played in different positions. Everyone got a chance to do stuff. But he had a parent storm off and sit in the car. Two more private messaged me because I rotate every position. I haven't been home five minutes. His under sixes had a lot of fun, but maybe not their parents. So often, if we're going to make changes to how we do stuff, we have to bring the key people with us. So how often do you talk to your parents about why, why you do what you do? When I coach my nursery group, I purposely coach in the corner where all the parents are because I want them to see what we're doing. I talk to them on the sideline. This doesn't look like camogie or hockey or whatever it is, but we're doing this because these are the reasons. So we want to make sure that we use competition appropriately for young players to support their development towards their long-term goal. And a couple of years ago, I was really fortunate, a good few years ago, I was really fortunate in one of my first kind of gigs in talent development to work with uh, Limer Curling. Uh, where I'm from and uh, I was involved with a couple of their kind of development teams and their minor team and I was involved with the with the guy on the slide here Shane uh, Fitzgibbon who was the minor coach 
And um, a couple of years ago, I happened, when Limerick were in the All-Ireland, I happened to bump into Shane outside Crow Park. And we were walking in and we were having the chats. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. And my partner kind of said to Shane going, God, isn't it like, isn't it a shame? So this team that are playing the All-Ireland today have like 10, 12, 13 of the guys that you had. It's 15, 16, 17s and minors. But no one here knows that all the work that you did. No one knows that they came through, that the, chat, the, the development experience that they got. And Shane just looked at him like he had two heads and said, what are you talking about? That's not why I was doing, that's not why I coach underage. That's not why I would coach a minor team. I'm coaching a minor team because of what those guys are going to do today. And no one needs to know that it was that I had anything to do with it. And for me, that is absolutely what underage coaching is about. It's about having a long term agenda. It's about looking at the big picture and delaying that gratification. And there was another coach in that coaching group and he kind of one day we were having a, a meeting and he kind of threw down his pen and went, you know, Anya, if you're saying it's not about winning the minor championship, it's, that's not the most important thing. How am I going to judge myself about how good an underage coach I am? And the answer is easy. It's you can't tell that until five, six, seven years down the line. And most of those kids are still playing. Some of them are playing in Crow Park. Others are in your junior Bs. Other are, others are just involved in your club. But you can't tell if you're a good junior underage coach until those kids have moved past you, until you've passed them on with the skills that they need to be good later. And I suppose that that kind of brings us to, to this stage of the, the kind of the evidence underpinning or the rationale and the philosophy underpinning why we were doing thirst because we wanted to give young players as positive and an effective experience as possible and we wanted to put coaches at the center of that we wanted the coaches to be the facilitators of that environment and that environment there's already lots and lots of research out there and this is a really busy slide so all i want you to do is look at those four things and one of the things we do is that if I go into a club and people go, oh, is that a good club? And they go, of course it is. They won the minor championship and they have six players on the county minor team and they've this. And I was like, OK, that's the outcome of the club. That's that. I'm not necessarily judging it on the outcome. I want to judge it on the process. What happens every Saturday on the pitch, on a Tuesday on the pitch? What does it feel like when I'm in that environment? And how is that related to talent development? So when, as a parent, when my kid joins a new club, I hang around, I ask questions because I want to find out if these four features are there. Is there long term aims and methods? Are people doing, are people coaching in the club for the long term? Is there a place for everyone on a team? Do, does everyone get to play all the time in as near as possible? Are coaches developing a range of skills for, for later on? Is there wide ranging coherent messages? Do the under six coaches talk to the under eight coaches, talk to the tens, twelves, seniors, minors, whatever it is? Unfortunately, the answer is often no. And again, we'll talk about kind of how that impacts on Thuris later on. But in a club, we want lots of people doing lots of the same thing in more or less the same way. So I joined up thinking within that club. We want to make sure that a club emphasizes appropriate development and not just early success. Yeah, it's brilliant if you're winning, but are you winning doing the right thing? Are you winning um, giving people the opportunity to get better? Do more people um, move up the, do most people move up the age groups as you go? And that's a really good sign of a club, really good retention, that more people are getting involved as you move up the age groups because they're bringing friends along. And the fourth one's really important. A really good environment will have individualized and ongoing development. So James might be the best player on the under 14s, and he's going to play under 16s and that's great because he needs that, te that to be tested and challenged in that way. Anya mightn't be the best player there, but I'm going to give her opportunities to get better. I'm going to give her the chance to develop the skills to stay involved so I can differentiate. And that's really hard if you're working in your club and you're one of three coaches working with 40 players. But we have to make sure that we, we provide appropriate experiences for all the players that we're involved with. So James is going to talk a bit about how we went from there to implementing uh, the Thurs programme in terms of supporting coaches um, develop those sort of environments. Yes, yeah, so, so looking, looking, at, looking at, the at the key, key features, features um, um, and put the coaches at the centre. Um, um, we, look, we looked across uh, clubs, schools, schools and academies, and, those people, and we're looking at kind of a long-term success with our, with our methods. So, one of those was resources, and um, we, we've, we've, done, we've done a list of resources that kind of look to put 
staged approach to coaching. Um, now, before anyone jumps off their, off, their, off, their, off their chair and says, we can't stage it that simply, we will get into that. But secondly, what was really important was a coach developer program to go with it. So all the stuff that Anya was bringing to the table and all the stuff that we already understood, it probably gave us clarity as to what we wanted to get across. And you know, sometimes I jump between those four features, key features that Anya spoke about. Sometimes I think they're really simple and other times I think they're really complex. So it, it depending on where I am in my thinking. So trying to get that to the ground to the coaches, we knew we needed to take quite a simple approach to it. So our first method was this stage specific coaching. And as I said, for some people, this will raise questions about, you know, well, we can't label kids at each age group, but to, to use a phrase on you use there, you're on, we just try to do the right thing. So you'll see here, we've got cards that outline seven to nine, 10 to 11, 12 to 13, 14 to 15, 16 to 17. And what we're trying to do is get coaches to do the right thing at each of those age groups. I stress again that this was a guide because the developmental needs of different kids at different stages on the pathway, of course, are gonna range. But then going back to my previous slide of putting the coach developer program with it, this allowed us to really get into the, into the nuts and bolts of it. So what we're trying to do on the next slide, we're looking at the bigger picture, and we're trying to make what's really, really complex, we're trying to make it simple. So it just hold it up there on you. This is the TPP model, which we'd be aware of across coach education programs in the GEA. If anybody's engaged with it, it may be the first time for some people seeing it. But it talks about developing the whole player. So to take what Anya's talked about, right in the core, right in the middle, is the psychological capabilities needed at each stage along the pathway. What's really important is, if Anya clicks back two or three there, if we take away any of those capabilities or those areas as a coach, and we don't deal, so we, if we deal just in the technical, just in decision making, and just in psychological, what we're abandoning is the physical requirements, the ability to work in a team, and also our participant feedback. So it's really important across this staged approach to coaching is that we deal with the whole player. Because very often, we're stuck in the technical. And when we get stuck in the technical, our players fall down, and back to our long-term focus and our long-term um, aim, our players won't live up to the capabilities that they may have. So that's a really important, at the core of this program, it's nothing new or breaking away from what already exists in the GA program, because it's underpinned by the TPP. So if we click on on you, we try to describe what that is at every stage along the pathway. So here, it's at 12 to 13. We've got a player in that age, and we look to try and say, where could we be, where should, could we help to develop coaches technically, tactically, team play, physical fitness, participant feedback, how do they understand what we're doing, and then across the psychological focus, which is a huge area. Interestingly enough, when we set out to do this, these four circles along the outside that are gonna come up as Anya clicks in, they became, what we thought was really important was gonna be the circle in the center, but really, in, in terms of tourists and coach development, it was all the stuff on the outside. So what does the coach need to know? So we set, we set a, a few tasks at each stage for the coach to know and, and, and to improve their coaching. Top right-hand side, what kind of environment should they look to create? We're back to fun being the number one priority, coach to player ratios, how many footballs or slitters we should have in our sessions. So real helpful tips around the environment. What to expect from the player? So player capabilities, and we certainly didn't invent this or create it. This is in, in so many pathways across so many sports. What should we see at each stage along the pathway? So at 12 to 13, players will begin to see that relationship between effort and outcome. They won't see that at nursery at five or six. But at 12 to 13, they'll begin to acknowledge that. Third down, become very self-conscious in front of the group at 12 to 13. That's not something coaches have to deal with three and four years previously, but right now we think it's important for coaches to understand that and maybe that will affect their coaching. Bottom right then is the game. What does the game look like? What, how many aside? Um, we say here going up to 11 v 11. Colin Clear who's on this call will always use the example of it's like a speed limit. If we say 11 v 11, don't try and get up to that speed limit. Work your way back. At 12 to 13, if I see 5v5s or 7v7s, there's far more learning going on. So again, it's, it's really in the lower age groups, it's stressing what, what, what we try to get across in goal games. And you know what? It's probably not forgetting that all those developmental needs in goal games 
are still so applicable to teenage players for the variety of reasons, as, as Anya pointed out there. So that's our player pathway along each stage. As I said, all these resources will be made available to anybody on this call at, at the end of it. But that was a real big part of the tourist program. And to be honest, when we set out to do this, before Anya's involvement, involvement, that's probably all we thought we needed to do, was to provide stage-specific content and get it out there to the masses, and it'll improve them as coaches. But we learned very quickly that that's not enough, and the resources are really good, and we've designed them that if you just pick them up off the street, you will become a better coach. But then what we try to do as part of our coach developer program is make you even better. So what it looks like is, using that staged approach again, we would bring in all the under 13 coaches in a region, so it might be five or six clubs, and they'd come to your first circle on the left-hand side here, which is our staff delivering player pathway workshops. And I suppose the beauty of these is that you come to a course that's specifically about what your coaching looks like on a Tuesday and what your game looks like on a Saturday. So again, back to our formal coach ed, where we try to cover everything. Yes, we have it split up into child, youth, adult within the course, but we don't really dig into what that content is because it would be impossible to do. So here, for the first time, we try and dig into what an under-13 coach should specifically be looking to do in his sessions at the weekend. And we've had really, really good feedback and really, really good embracing it. That's just the workshop. And again, I suppose that's stage two. If you pick up a resource and never engage with us, we think you're a better coach. If you come to our workshop and don't do anything beyond that, you're a better coach. But the real learning comes across when our staff can get out to you in your environment. So if I'm an under 13 coach in my local club, I come to that workshop and I'm absolutely enthused by it. I talk about all the challenges I have and all the things that need to make my better session. But what am I like the following Tuesday when I go back and coach? And there we'd like to equip you with our GDAs to get out and help and to see what it's really like. So this is the first time and what Anya is going to delve into here is our principles. So you'll see in the top, our staff would partake a session. Let me just go back a little bit on it. Would partake a session with me and my under 13s and we look to embed those principles that we talked about in the workshop. The second visit when our staff comes back to you again will be all about my coaching session. And now I'm, I'm, I'm working with my coach developer and, and staff and it's me delivering the session and we're working together to what that looks like. But the key, key, key thing here was for us, the discovery of principles. So what I've spoken about for the last three sessions is what we coach. So it's what we coach from five-year-old that walks into the club up to our under 17 and into our adult players because it's really important to know what we should be coaching all the time. But the real kicker and the real improvement is how you coach. And if we then are able to equip people on how you coach, then we think we're on the pig's back. We have the what, and if we can really improve the coaches on how they coach, then that's it. Before I hand you back to Anya, the simple way for me is if we all go to our coaching workshops, which are really, really good and we see the best in the business, we're seeing what they coach. And we probably try and come back and ate that session back with our, with our, with our possibly our kids sessions, our youth sessions and our adult sessions. But why, what if we were able to say, why is the coach doing it? Or how is the coach doing it? Then we'd more understand what he's doing his activities for, how he's delivering them and how he's getting his players involved along the way. And that would really allow us to deliver the session back even more powerful. So Anya's going to talk now about what she brought to us in terms of those principles and how it's underpinned what we do. And then I'll come back in to, sh to talk a little bit about the results of that and, and how it's made our coaches better coaches. So brilliant. Thanks, James. And I guess what we did was that we looked at exactly what James said, is that often when we're thinking about coach development and coach education, look, and I've been that coach, I want to come in and I want to get a bag of drills and a bag of, uh, you know, ideas to bring back to my to my session. But actually, we've really tried to challenge coaches from nursery right the way through to inter-county level to go, actually, why do you do things in the way to, that you do it in your context for the players that you're coaching? So that's what these five principles uh, look at. Uh, don't underestimate the time. It got us to match them to the word thirst. So the first principle goes, we want a session, we want your coaching to be testing and challenging, that all players should be challenged at their individual level. The second one goes, uh, we need to understand that the player is at the centre of the game and that's been clearly depicted in the resources we've shown. Or we want it to resemble the game, 
that it wants to be game based. Now, as you'll see later, that doesn't mean that every session is a game. That doesn't mean that every session looks like a hurling match or a football match or whatever. But it does mean that the things that you're coaching are part of the jigsaw that allow people to play the game. We want all players involved all the time. And for me, it's like people often ask, you know, what resources do you need in a club? And you need two resources. You need people and you need balls. The more people you have, the more balls you have, the more chances players are going to be involved, they're going to be engaged and they're going to be learning. And finally, the, the last one is probably the most important one. It needs to be an enjoyable, developmentally appropriate and holistic GA experience. And if we can get those principles right, and if we can kind of interrogate our coaching against those principles, it, the chances are the, the players that are coming to us are going to get a really positive experience. It might be challenging, it might be difficult, but they're progressing and they're getting better as a result of it. So I'll talk a little bit around each of those principles. And I guess the first one is this idea of it needs to be testing and challenging. And I use this idea of if you've had a kid or if, you, if your kid has ever learned to ride a bike, it's pretty frustrating and it's a pretty difficult uh, thing to teach them. And it's for me, it reminds me of coaching. So if I go down and coach my under 10s or under 12s and I tell them to stand at this cone and hit the ball to that cone and then run to there and go to there, the session looks really good. It kind of looks like my kid cycling her bike and stabilizers. She's able to cycle up and down the village. She can get there, but she's not learning and she's not getting better. And I think that happens a lot in coaching. We see a lot of joystick stuff, a lot of very safe things where people are almost running through the motions. And we don't really learn in that in that way if we're not tested and we're not challenged against where we want to go. So for me, coaching is about taking off those stabilizers. So it's about within my session, I'm going to let people fall. I'm going to let people mess up. I'm going to allow them time to figure stuff out. Like the lady in the second picture, I'm going to be there to pick them up. Yeah, but I'm going. So it's like when I'm teaching my kid to cycle, I'm almost holding her when I take the stabilizers off first, but I have to let her fall to figure out how she gets better and for me that's really good coaching giving kids a chance to get up get down uh, and move around and try things out and like the guy in the last picture geez the success of that is that we're developing autonomous independent decision makers that are able to play the game at any level often when i work in a inter-county setup we'll talk we'll talk with coaches and they'll go yeah geez james is a great player He's a great minor, but he just can't make a decision or he can't do things without me on the sideline. Often because on the pathway, he's just had the stabilizers on and he hasn't he hasn't had a chance to fail. And a couple of um, months ago, I was giving a talk and one of the coaches we were talking about this and he said a really nice example. He said his kid plays soccer and he goes down to the soccer club and he looks in admiration at the under 10 soccer coach because all the kids are sitting in a line. It looks really neat. They've all the stabilizers on. They're waiting their turn. They're going up, doing their drill, coming back, etc. And he went, geez, I'd love to be a hurling coach like that because my sessions are chaotic. The kids aren't listening. There's balls flying everywhere, etc. Until his kid came home after a soccer session and said, I don't want to go back again. That's boring. I'm sitting down. It's no crack. It's no fun. It's not enjoyable. So maybe let's not be afraid of, of giving kids a chance to test and challenge them putting them into positions with some of the skills to be able to fly, but then being like the lady in the, in the middle, ha having a coaching environment that give, then tweaks those skills and gives them the chance to go again. And I think this idea of a skateboard park is a really good kind of analogy for coaching. If you ever go down a skateboard park, there's lots of kids from four to 40 and they're learning how to skate. There's no coaches around, but they're, they're teaching each other and they're not just having a go at it. They're purposefully working hard. The older kids are working with the younger kids. They'll do a bit of video analysis and record themselves and go back and try again. And it's tough going, they'll fall down, they'll get hurt, but they'll come out of that kind of chaotic up and down um, kind of coaching environment with a really robust set of skills. And for me, that's what we want. We want a coach that knows when to step in and step out, knows when to test players, knows when to make it really comfy for players when it's getting too much but tweaks the environment so that it's a really positive learning experience. And so that's the first, first um, uh, principle. And the second principle is that we have to understand that the players are at the center of the game. And I don't know, some people on the call might have seen this story maybe sometime last year. And it was, a, it was an open letter from an under 14 pair, uh, player in Limerick. And it was about how he'd stopped playing hurling. And it really struck a curve 
chord for me. So I'm not gonna, obviously going to read the letter, but what it, what it says is, look, I grew up in Limerick. All I wanted to do was hurl. I would have done anything. I went to every training session. I went to every match. I was there all the time, but I never got put on. I got five minutes at the end of a game. I didn't get on sometimes. When I asked the coach, you know, why, did, why didn't I get to play? Uh, the, you know, the coach said, oh, come on, we want to win this game. Uh, the, the player talks about how they had an attitude of win at all costs and didn't care who they upset, that they were shouted at for not doing the right thing. So it was a really big, big, important game. He wanted to go. He did the training session. He got called into the where the team was being announced and he told he wasn't he wasn't going to play. He wasn't going to get on the pitch. And he came home, turned around to his parents and said, look, I'm never going to hurl again. I want to give up hurling. Why would I put myself in that position? And that's a 13 year old boy that and we all have probably similar stories from our sports that do that. And the key thing for me is, though, if we do the right thing early, we'll be like these guys and we'll lift, we'll walk the steps of the Hogan Sand and lift the, lift the All-Ireland. And we'll set people up to just play in the game. By doing the wrong thing early, we might get some of this uh, elite success, but we mightn't. And we certainly won't get lots of people being retained in, in the game and playing at, at all levels as they go through. And I heard someone talk about this recently, and it was a really good idea. It's a really good mantra to have. You don't want to be anybody's last coach. So if you're coaching young people in sport, you don't want to be the last coach that they had. You want to make sure that you put their, their interests and their their ability and their potential center to what you do and that you move them on to someone else who will give them another positive experience. And look, most, I, I, I haven't met a, a coach yet who goes out to do a bad job. I've met hundreds of really enthusiastic, really careful, really considerate coaches. And our idea around the principles is almost that it gives us a chance to audit our behavior. So going home in the car, did I put the player at the centre of the game? How did Johnny feel when he didn't get on the pitch? Did I talk to him afterwards? And it gives us a chance to almost think about the decisions we make through the eyes of the player and gives us a chance to put them central to the decisions um, on, on the pitch. So the third one is that we want it to be player centred and we want to give them the skills to stay and play in the game. So. This idea, to, it's you know an old idea, if I can't catch, I won't play. So if I can't catch, okay, I can sail. Uh, I can do kind of a couple of other sports, but I certainly can't play hurling, football, rounders, camogie, whatever it is. If I can't strike, I won't play these games. So it's really important that we get these fundamental skills early so to ensure players that they perceived an actual competence. Again, people often think of these fundamental skills as nursery or under eights or under tens. And now I'm working with the 14, so I'm going to teach them to field under a high ball with, with defence, but the kids can't catch a ball. So I sometimes, like the Christmas tree, I have to go back to basics. I have to think about the fundamental skills that the kids have before I move them on. The, um, the third principle is that it resembles the game. And I think this is a really important one. And I guess one that is really important to the type of activities, and James alluded to it earlier on. And the first real thing I'd like to emphasize is that kids are not mini adults. So the same sporting experience that we give them as uh, a senior, that we have as senior players, is certainly not applicable to be to be um, underage players. It, I've sat at big matches and I see people taking down the, the, the warm up because that's what they're going to do with their kid, their under 14s on a Saturday. I see people go, oh, I'm going to bring in the Dublin whatever coach to help with my team, but he's coaching these adults and you're coaching the under 16s. So horses for courses. So we have to make sure that we're giving kids experiences that are appropriate to their age and stage of development. Even when they're really good kids, really high performance players, they still don't, uh, the, the, an adultification of the game still isn't appropriate in terms of how we coach them. And I think the real, a really important thing is that we start with the end in mind. What do we want to get out of our competition? What do we get, want to get out of our training session? And for me, this, this is one of the principles that I've seen such change in, in terms of the coaches that we've worked with over the last few years. And it really comes down to the type of activities that happen within a game or within a training session. So because of this, we see much more small-sided games. So like James said, we, you know, the 11 v 11 is kind of like the, 
the limit on your credit card. It's not a target. We want to do smaller amount of games because we want people to have lots of touches, lots of actions, lots of decisions. We want to see as many players involved all the time. So I'm going to take a busload of kids down to Limerick to play a game. Instead of you know taking one team down and 10 kids sitting on the sideline, I'm going to play you know six six sides against whatever club it is. So I'm going to organise my involvement to make sure that kids play lots of different games. Now I won't do that every Saturday. Other Saturdays I'll play a full type of game. Other Saturdays I'll do something else. But we have to make sure that we've a, a mix and a kind of a variable diet of, of experiences for them. We might have skill sessions. We might have debriefing. We might. Uh, I work with some coaches who do really nice stuff around letting players um, do the half time, letting players uh, debrief the other team, letting players um, uh, make substitutions. We get them involved because there are some of the skills. If you remember the psychological skills, if we can design our activities, the, all of those things resemble the game. They're the things that make people good in the version that we have at the end, then we have to make sure that that's how we coach. And again, we just simple things. We have to make sure that the context fits the the um, the young player. I was at a, a blitz last year, an under eight blitz, and there was uh, or, yeah, an under eight blitz, and there was a the small her slither being used. And I was like, why? Oh, because those kids are moving up to under tens next year, and they need to get used to it. It's like. I don't, you know, you have to think of the context your kid is in now and your players are in now rather than looking too far ahead in terms of what they're not prepared to do. And there's some really nice examples. Uh, you know, lots of balls, lots of movement, people making decisions, chaotic. We'd probably like to see, you know, more videos will show um, game based stuff where there's different outcomes to different things that are going on. So we want coaching that has all players involved all the time. We want lots of touches, lots of decisions. So less stand here, do this, do that. More giving players a chance to figure stuff out that might look awful on the sideline, but it's a really positive learning experience to get them there, to get them the skills that they need for later. And the final first principle is that it should be an enjoyable, developmentally appropriate GA experience. I use this idea of Man City um, under fives elite team. Thankfully, our nurseries don't look like that yet. But in other sports, we put these labels on kids early about who they are and what they're going to do. Actually, we've no idea where our under fives, under eights and under tens are going to end up. So we have to make sure that we give as many of them an enjoyable experience. Use appropriate, developmentally appropriate activities. Not challenge things not think that it doesn't look like the adult game, but it should fit the context that those kids are working in. So what we've done with those five principles, just give some examples about the rationale underpinning it and then what it would look like in different contexts. And like James will talk about now when he comes into how it would work, it's, it's, it's just good coaching. It's actually giving you a framework to make some of the coaching decisions that lots of you are doing anyway, but just with an eye to giving the players, a re putting the player at the centre of those decisions. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks Anya. Anya. Um, um, for, lack, for, lack, for lack of lack video, I'll we'll give you some video, picture video, examples. Example. So, so, I just have an echo there, echo Peter, there, if you could. Sorry, let me stop. Um, so, so, what we have is testing a challenge in the first one, and our simplest language that we can put to that is that in today's session as a coach, I'll ask players to mark a, feel, a mark a player they feel will really test them to play their best. So what we're going to give is some really little simple examples. While this is probably the first time you've seen these five words together, I can guarantee you good coaching is good coaching. And there's lots of these things that you're doing already. All we're trying to do is create a checklist or, or, or something to reflect on all the time to assess your own coaching. So in order to test and challenge them in all their sessions, a really easy way in the game at the end is you ask the players to pick someone who they feel will test. There's lots in that and empowerment of players and that they understand their own ability and the player's ability around them. Let's we'll move it on, Anya. Yeah. Se secondly, on Anya's second principle, how, we might, how that might look like on the pitch is that we might, during the course of today's session, I will strive to give four of my players individual feedback from our most recent match and see can they act on it during today's session. So that's really, really powerful stuff. And that's not 
20 kids in front of you, 30 kids in front of you, teenagers, whatever, adult players. That's you individually talking to a player, making an observation on their game and asking them to work on it in that session. That is unbelievably powerful. And we find the coaches aren't doing it. So that's a, and that just comes down to your communication with your players and really showing those players that you're looking at the game. Thirdly, then, on resembles the game. I think it, because there's been a huge amount of coach ed in this and it's very much embedded in our GA coach education program on games-based, we really do this really well, I think. And it's something we want to stay doing and not move away from. Today, all my activities are game-based to bring all the skills of the game into play. Something that could be really, really, really hard to involve in your session, play a game, you're bringing all the games. Of course, there's a place for individualized, in isolating a skill, in activities, and trying to spend maybe a, se a section of your session on that. But by and large, we're looking for game-based sessions. All the players involved, all the time, lots of touches, lots of decisions. One thing that I say straight away, and Anya said it, if your session doesn't look like it has lots of footballs or lots of slitters, you're never going to really hit this principle. So that's one thing you can go away straight away. But one of the things here is, today I've set up activities to ensure my players make a huge number of individual and team decisions. And crucially, at some stage during the session, I'm going to ask three players to explain a decision they made during the course of the session. You might ask them individually, quietly, ask them in the course of a game, why did you make that decision? Or you may stop the session really quickly, ask the question, and they'll share it back with all the players. One thing you won't do doing that is standing on the sideline and watching the games happen and maybe refereeing it from afar won't allow you that interaction. So for me, in asking players about decisions they're making, really important that you put yourself as a coach right in the middle of that game. Okay, so if a game starts in, in, in sessions, very often our coaches stand back and think their work is done. Throw yourself into the middle of it, position yourself right around the game and ask players about decisions they're making because that is the one part of their game that's really difficult to develop through activities that you set up. It's them that will make the decisions and them that will improve themselves as players. And then lastly, should be enjoyable, developmentally appropriate and a holistic GAA experience. I have set up today's session to be one that players will really enjoy. So as, as an absolute target for yourself, what a powerful sentence and not something we do enough. Will your players enjoy your session? I will encourage laughing and fun throughout the session. So how many times have you seen a coach maybe ask for quiet, tell, coaches to, tell players to stop laughing, give out the players for messing, whatever it might be. It happens all the time. I can say it because I've definitely done it. Well, here, let's see if Jesus, if players are down there and they're enjoying themselves, then that's really good. Interestingly, we didn't use the word fun because fun for one person might necessarily be fun for the other. So what's enjoyable is very much different. So you'll have your serious player who for, for them, enjoyable is really serious and, and they're really serious throughout their session. The player beside them could laugh their way through it and be just as effective on your team. So that's understanding how it's enjoyable for different players. And I think that's why Anya didn't use the word fun in the fact that enjoyable has got completely different meaning to it. But I think, like the first sentence there, you as a coach, the onus on you is to make that session fun. And just before we leave those all on the one sheet, for me, as I said to you, we had resources and we had a program. But what we didn't have was principles before Anya's involvement and putting words around it. And I started by, by assessing my own coaching in it. And after I've done a session and getting really comfortable with the principles, it only, it only really hit home and, and really gave me ultimate buy into this program is how effective it was for my own coaching. So if we jump down to R, resembles the game, I think my, my sessions were quite game-based. I think I generally got all the players involved all of the time, lots of decisions. I think I was quite good at that. And I think I, I, I recognised the enjoyment side of it after I picked up a lot of experience in it. So from RAS, I think my sessions did have a lot of them. Where I think I was lacking was the testing and challenging. All players should be challenged to improve at their level. So I thought I was doing a really good session that looked the business, that got everybody involved, that were game-based. But were they testing and challenging all the players? And they definitely weren't. And I think where I was probably failing was, interestingly, the better players. Because I was presuming with my sessions that they were getting enough out of it. But I wasn't testing and challenging them. So what I do now is driving away from sessions or walking away from sessions it's just quickly run down through them. And I'd ask you to do that of your own coaching right now, looking at those words, that which is the principles for you that you think you need to work on as a coach? And if you get comfortable with these principles and you understand them, 
it will really help you plan and reflect on your sessions. And that's what coaching is all about. And that's why I said at the very start, I really jump between is coaching really simple or is it really complicated? But I think if you understand these principles and are able to look at your own coaching, I think you'll find coaching a lot, a lot easier and you'll be giving the players a better experience as well. So I suppose then to look at where we are now and, and to be honestly honest on what has worked for us and what hasn't worked, what's worked really well is that we've got huge and get huge engagements. And I think that came from where we set about with this originally was that it kind of came from the ground in, in the fact that it was what people were looking for. What should I do at this age? And it's really got people to buy into those workshops. And I think they enjoy having their coach, having the coach developers come and look at their sessions, which isn't simple and isn't easy to do. And it's really good to see coaches open up and want that to come into their sessions. What didn't work for us was our consistency in our message. And I think, as I said, we started this in 2017. So 18 and 19 were our two full years. And we probably didn't understand the power of the principles. And that's why I have underneath to correct what didn't work is the principles, the principles, the principles. We have the content, we have the what. We've got resources that, that are getting out there and getting into the hands of so many people. But really, it's the principles that underpin what we do. And it's the principles that make, that leave something behind with it. So we talk about self-sustainability in a club. Jesus, if your coaches understand their coaching and are better coaches under these principles, as Anya says, better coaches, better players. So. It took us a little while to learn the importance of those principles and I'm delighted for people seeing this the first time today. We can jump and fast forward straight to that. So, and I think, I think to, to reinforce the, the importance of those, just looking at three real pictures, we, you'll see here we've got a, a, one of our coach developers going out, uh, feet on the grass, working with an under six coach and leaving behind on that, sheet, on that sheet behind the resource card there the coaching principles and, and how the coaches can work with it. So just scanning through the next photo as well, please, Anya. It's just reinforcing the same message. And then interestingly in talent academies, and look, there's a huge amount we can talk in this program and, and, and hopefully you'll engage with us again a, a, along, along what we do here. But back in November, we, we brought in all the county minor hurling and football uh, managers, coaches, backroom team, you know, selectors or whoever was running the coaching sessions for people. We threw an open invite out there and we got a really good response. So we're in Tullamore with Anya. Um, we had Niall Corcoran, coach of the Leash, uh, senior, uh, the Leash Senior Hurlers and working in Dublin as a, as a development officer. We had David Goff come in uh, with James Owens and we had this guy, Jack Cooney, who's um, about to start a study with Anya around how we can make this even more impactful and how these principles can really help our Talent Academy coaches. And I think Anya said it very early that for an under six coach right up to senior inter-county, and we have that in our, in our, with Jack Cooney, with Niall Corker and people working at the very top of our game, looking at these principles and making their coach better, down to my club, local club where nobody's ever coached in their life. They try and take on a nursery program. And if we can provide what to do at nursery and then a couple of visits to show them how to do it, the improvement of them is just through the roof. So it's from the top of our game right down to the bottom of the game. Um, and like I say, as much as Anya's given us the background, we've gone through our resources. We really are scratching the surface on, on, on what we do in this program and, and engaging with it will we, we'll hopefully show you the power of it. That's it. So I think for 2020, um, you'll, you'll, you'll forgive me, this slide and this plan was, was put together before March 17th when our world collapsed around us. So. What we, what we wanted to do was take it from the age appropriate uh, specific stuff that we've done it over a couple of years. We've now moved into a club based co community of practice. So what we've done is bring all the coaches in 2020 from nursery right up to under 17 and adults if they come in. And we've all the coaches in the room and we're, we're going through our principles. Again, we're going through the content and the age specific stuff. So we've kind of flipped it from, I suppose, a coach developer program it's now a club developer program. And if you'd allow me to, to dream for a second or yourselves in your own club, that if every single coach in your club was a better coach and we got all the grass stuff and the pitch stuff right, everything else will roll in behind it. So again, if we recruit right at nursery, under sevens, eights, nines, and we make those people better coaches, they mightn't coach beyond 10 or 11 as, as the demand for numbers of coaches fog off. But I can guarantee you they'll re reinvest their times back in the club and they're involved in what we do. So this is a coach developer program 
but it's become a club developer program because we're trying to get everybody in and that club-based community of practice allows us to do that. So that was our plan in 2020. We've got a huge amount of activity. Um, we're so lucky with the staff we have in all our counties and they're, they're rolling out webinars that have got huge numbers coming to them. And, and, and uh, we're just dying for this to lift that we can, the plan is that we've delivered that online, that we can now go on the grass and deliver what we wanted to do in that visit two and visit three. So please God, when, we, um, when, when everything goes back to a little bit normal and we're back on the grass, the webinar stuff, we can build into it on the grass as well, so it hasn't changed what we do. So that's what we're hoping to do for 2020, is grow the thing and um, try and empower the whole club. Because, sorry, I, I should mention that we're, people that came, that feedback came from people, that, uh, coaches that engaged with the programme with us, saying this is really good. God, I wish the age above and the age below were doing the same thing as us. So again, we've adapted, as Anya said, it looks different. It looks a hell of a lot different now than it probably did in February. But um, I think it's robust enough to, to, to carry those challenges. Fantastic. And I think, you know, for me, the real thing around the Thurs principles is just kind of like what James was saying, is that this isn't a blueprint of how to coach. You know, we want different types of coaches doing different types of things in your club. So the way I coach isn't how the under 10s or the senior or whatever coaches, but we actually all coach with the same sort of principles. And that makes us really coherent. And I, what I really like about the way Thurs has gone is just what James has said there, is actually the value of bringing all your coaches together in your club. And I think it's something that we don't do enough in that we don't all get together and talk about what we're doing. How often do you invite a coach from another team to come and watch you? How often do you um, think about, you know, the getting people involved or getting involved in other, in other aspects? So I think the more we can work together, the be better. Because for me, coaching is a, is a decision-making process. It's about how, what are the principles that help guide what we do? And I think, you know, just to kind of finish, if it's, it's these two worlds. And if you think of the, the box of ingredients there, it's like a food delivery company. It sends us a bunch of food every week. It's kind of like going to a coaching course and getting lots of drills. And everyone will go out on a Tuesday night and they'll coach in exactly the same way because that's what the recipe card tells us to do. And I guess what we've purposefully done with her is saying, look, there isn't one way to coach, but there's, there's a, there's principles that should underpin your coaching. There's a way and you want to be more of a chef rather than a cook. So you get all of these ingredients and you use them in a way that's appropriate for your setting. So really, like Jane said, it's about principles and it's principles before methods. Why do I do what I do in the way that I do it? And it's this idea here. As to methods, there may be a million and then some principles are few. The man who grasps principles can su successfully select his own methods. And I think for me, that just wraps up what good coaching is. Here, what Thurs is, is a, is a guide, a direction of travel, if you like, that helps you make decisions about what you would do in the pitch against the people that are in front of you. And for me, I think, you know, Leinster GA have to really commend it in, in going about what was a pretty you know complex process to get here but really striving to make sure it was evidence-based that there was rationale and there was reason behind the, not just the content of it but also the delivery of it and i think the impact it's had on coaches at all levels of the game is testament to that kind of um the work that's gone on behind the scenes of it um so i think on such a beautiful uh, early summer's evening you've probably listened enough to, to us um, kind of talk around it. Uh, James and I's contact details are there and we're more than happy for people to get in touch um, if you've got questions or queries. And Peter, if there's questions now, we're more than happy to take them, I think. I think yeah, Peter's might, been answering might, them as we go, have you? Oh. Uh, no, not all of them. No, no, there's been a number of them there. We might, we might just cover a few if that's okay. Um, just, just because uh, like, like there's there's obviously a huge amount in there and, and, and might be nice just to have a few different questions. You mentioned a lot about the the, the early specialization and one of the questions here is one that, that I think a lot of us have been banging drums about for the last while. Do, does the GA or do, do GA clubs have a huge advantage over other sports because we have hurling and football and handball and rounders? Absolutely. And it was actually in my notes to talk about. 
it's like it's the advantage of being in a dual club which thankfully most of our clubs are is that you know I, I will play hurling and I will play football and I will have opportunities to do other stuff so yeah being able to develop that range of activities but also I think it's, it's not being afraid to let the kids go and do something else you know so not being afraid to let them go and play rugby or soccer the key in that is that it's a pain for the under 14 coach if your kid if some of the players are missing some of your sessions but they'll go away get a, a range of experiences elsewhere and if you make your sport the best destination for them they'll choose to come back to hurling or football or whatever at 16 17 or 18 when it really starts to matter and they might come back as better players so not not yes we're definitely at an advantage in ga because there's multiple it's a multiple sport organization and for the most part um promotes that uh but i think as well not being afraid to to allow pl people play other stuff okay what you want to add there no i'm not i think that's 100 percent answer right uh, the range of sports we offer i think is, is something that needs to be looked at as a positive and maybe not a negative that sometimes it can become a conflict i think play everything what about those clubs then where, where expectations from we'll say officialdom can be quite high about about success and competitiveness and how how can a coach who subscribes to everything that we discussed tonight how can they convince those gatekeepers in clubs that this is the right way to go i think for us it's a great question i think for us it's probably part of what we plan to do in 2020 with that club if you have all your coaches in the room one of the activities we ask um, in the in the workshop is what kind of a club do we want to be perceived as or let's let's outline a pathway that people who wear this crest look like and you'll very quickly get the masses in the room or the most people in the room look funnily enough along the development line of things and when you get all the coaches in the room with that powerful strong message then I wouldn't like to be the coach that goes out and maybe doesn't live those values or, or goes against the grain of the club so I think it's one of the things for us, Peter, of, of getting that club interaction and creating. We don't we we do arrive with a player pathway, but we actually let them create it before they see it. And then you've got all the clubs. We, we haven't wrote this from scratch or anything like that. This is what people see, and very often it matches up to it. And then, like I said, you get the consensus in the room that this is the way we want to go as a club. And breaking that or going outside of that room, I think will we'll show up for everybody else in it. And just to add to that as well, of course. Doing the things that we've talked about today doesn't mean you're not going to be successful. You know, actually doing things right can get you success as well. It's a byproduct of, of doing the right thing, but you're right, it's having buy-in. Uh, I'd suggest parents are a really strong buy-in. So if you can get that, get parents on your side in terms of why you're doing what you're doing, that can give, that is a lot of leverage. And I think clubs and coaches and even parents can sometimes be in a, in a difficult position because you know, if we go down to my local GA club and this is my message, but my son also plays soccer and he also plays, you know, whatever else. And but the message there might be completely different. And um, how can parents try to, to, to balance that uh, different needs or different different messages that player that their kids are getting? I, I and I think it's it's like I said when I put up some of those you know, like features of what a good environment looks like. That's how I choose which club to send my kids to. You know, so I could send them to this club that wins lots of stuff, but it mightn't be a very good development environment. It might be a very good winning environment. Uh, so it's it's as an organisation, maybe it's it's giving some of that that information that says actually here's the type of stuff you should be looking for in the clubs that are that you're looking at for your children. And what do we say to the to the coach or to the parent then who says, well? This is all fine, but ultimately only 15 can play. And at some stage, somebody has to be number 16. Absolutely. You know, they're the realities. And I think it's, but it's also, uh, the thing is only 15 can play in certain matches. That doesn't stop me playing different types of matches in different formats. It doesn't stop me having A, B, C, D teams. It doesn't stop me um, having different diet of competition. So it doesn't always have to be what we would traditionally see as a competition. You know, because that's just what an, you know, that's what an adult format looks like, isn't it? You know, why would that be appropriate for a 14, 15, 16 year old? So I think it's 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 also, though, they're the structures that are there and that's a real reality. So that's how our sport is organized. But actually, good coaches can coach really well within those structures. So maybe I don't play the same 15 every week. Maybe everyone on my squad starts the game every season, number one to 40. 
you know, so I make these developmental decisions about the team that I have that fit into that structure that's there. You know, I might mean I don't win, but, you know, I was giving, uh, we had the same conversation at a uh, workshop a few weeks ago, or a few months ago now, and a coach we were, said, well, who's the best coach, underage coach you've ever seen? And they talked about this ladies football coach who did exactly that. They got a county final. He gave everyone equal playing time, one to whatever it is on the squad. They lost the game, but all those girls came back and played the year after, and the year after, and the year after, because of the coaching decision that was made. I think, yeah, and I think, I think, I love it. I think in, in other sports as well, we're seeing this. I ask people to be a brave coach, and Anya's message of don't be anyone's last coach. And I think if you're brave and you look at games opportunities different and you, you seek out extra games than what is maybe there in the official games program to allow you to do those things, they're the brave coaches and they're the good coaches. And I think they're coaches that, that would, would find a lot in our principles and, and, and move away from traditional. And I wanted to maybe just before we finish up, speak about some of the academy stuff that you mentioned. And, and it's interesting you brought up the Tony Forrest uh, slide. I put that I put that stuff together. I'd say it must be ten years ago. And it still holds still still holds today, thankfully. And uh, interesting, you were talking about the second place and third place. Only one team finished as a runner up in Tony Forrest and one minor subsequently. Um, and that was Clare when they won the minor in 1997. Every other every other county, it's been a completely different uh, set of teams. Um, so yeah, it is. It is a really, really interesting um, statistic. And um, you want? Yeah, sorry. And it's interesting because if we see it across sports, so all the all the information across multiple sports says, look, being a being the most successful junior is is really badly related to being a very successful senior. It, the odd ones do, of course. You've got Venus, you've got Rory, you've got whatever, but they're the unicorns. They're the the one and whatever. What does matter is being there or thereabouts. So there's information for your academy stuff. How deep can you keep your pool? So if I've got a elite under 14s or a Kildare under 14s or whatever, that team probably shouldn't be the same 22 players at minor. There should be ins and outs. There should be flexibility in who's in there. There should be a broad pool, et cetera, because getting in and getting that environment is important, much more important than winning it. So that's a it, it, there's interesting kind of rationale there for kind of the academy structures as well. Yeah, that was going to be my next the next part of that question. What would a what would a good academy program look like then? I think for me, having been involved in academy programs and, and now working with, across all the counties in Leinster, I genuinely think it comes back to those five principles. I, I think from the top to our most talented players, testing and challenging, there may be. They come through academy programs untested and unchallenged. And I think it's it's like the Burkham stuff. Do we drop our best players or play our best players out of position? And then I suppose down, if, if we were ranking them one to 30, how big can we make that panel? As Anya says there, the more the more we can carry, the better and give them a bit good experience. And, and I genuinely, obviously blinded uh, and, and biased as I am, I think if our coaches in that program live these principles and coach through these principles, I think the rest looks after itself. So I, to me, everything we do in games development is, co is, is coach development. And I think coaches looking at a developmental process in our academy squads, everything else will fall into place. And just to add, absolutely. And just I think one of the important things for me from being in and around academies for the last 10 or so years is that they're often seen as part of, but not really part of, the intercounty structure. So, how often do does the senior coach right down to the under 14s get together to talk about what's the coherence of the plan? How often does the 16s coach work with the minor coach, work with the 21s, work with the senior? Really rarely, in my opinion, you know, and in my experience, you know, so there's very little sharing of practice in that. So, if I'm the under 16s coach, I should really be working really closely with the under 14s and the under 16s because I'm taking some of their players and I'm preparing the other guys to go somewhere else. And I should know what's happening at senior level because that's where they're ultimately going to go. And I think if we get a much more joined upness and then also appreciate that it's a development environment so that we can, like James said, we can be brave, we can take chances, we can do things differently because it's about developing players. They get lots of the other types of competitions elsewhere. So it's a, you know, it's a real opportunity if people are brave to use it um, with a long term focus. Uh, James, you spoke there about the, the use of the principles within clubs to identify, you know, what, what clubs want to be and so on. Um, a, a number of questions coming through about how, how we can get our clubs to buy in, uh, especially if, if you're the only profit in the, in the land. 
Well, I think if you get them there, Peter, they buy in naturally. And we don't go in turning your club upside down. All we do is go in and facilitate what does good coaching look like? And what does it look like from the nursery right up to adults? And the people in the room give us the answers. They're possibly, the buy-in is, is probably important, that there, there's a job for that person in the club. Or, or We ask the lads themselves to engage with those coaches and invite them personally. If you get people in the room and you create that community of practice, the buy-in comes from within. Um, it, it's getting people into that room, which, which we haven't found difficult. Um, people do come because they've been told something maybe that they haven't seen before and it will help them. But, but we don't do we do not do the, the magic answers. The answers come from the club because we, are, we all have the answers within our club. And just to add to that, and I think that initiative that James and the team have rolled out by going into the clubs is and will do pay huge dividends because it's actually empowered clubs then to develop a community amongst themselves. So they're not reliant on, you know, Leinster coming in with the answers. They're coming in with ideas. And actually now what we're seeing is those clubs are getting together and they're they're working in, in a pathway. So their 13s and 14s and 15s and 16s are all working together. Hurling a football are working together. So now that overcomes, you know, actually if we train like this, then everyone can play and you you coach them like this and I'll coach them like that. And just it opens up simply to people talking and sharing their practices. And again, I'm not sure we do enough of that um, anywhere. So this is a real, this has been a real catalyst for that. And it's been real kudos to that uh, kind of uh, innovation in the programme that has set that up in the clubs. Can we maybe finish with just one last question? It's something we often get when, when in these type of sessions that, that we speak about. Um, what about the talented, the talented player and the perception that the talented player won't, won't wait around or won't, won't be involved in this type of a system? It, it, it just depends what you mean by talented. So if you mean talented as the best performing one, um, often they don't become the best performing seniors. Also, good coaching will give them some of the skills early to cope with the challenges, um, but also will recognise that a lot of my research is around talent development and we'll look, go, if I'm the best performing Dublin under 14, I have a nice smooth pathway. I get on the team, 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 and then I don't get on the senior team. And that can be a real crash. Actually, a good development plan will rocky that road a bit earlier and give him some, some kind of periodised setbacks some challenges, some experiences that would give them the robustness and resilience or maybe physical skill set to make it at a later stage. We actually do a lot of our really talented players in injustice by just allowing them nice, easy, smooth upward trajectory until the, the real serious stuff happens at the end. Uh, okay. Peter, if I can just add to that just as we, as yeah, we come please, to the end as well. Just around the uh, resources there, we, we, we'll, we'll publish all of these on our website. We currently have a number of them up, but if you take down lensgga.e as I had it the last slide, we've spent a lot of this time upgrading, the, or sorry, adding to these resources with sessions. So we will go live with that on our website in the next week or two. So if I'll ask people to bear with us, and then there'll be a, in, in the next week or two, we will have all these resources freely available to them. And we don't, we don't mind getting them out there. Um, and and they can be, they can, I'm sure they can be very useful to everyone. Okay, that's as good a way as any to end, James. So I wanted to just say thanks very much to James and thanks to Anya for all the work that's been put into this over the last number of weeks for this session, but obviously over the last number of years for the programme. Um, we're continuing the, the Coach webinar series next Tuesday uh, and the registration for the next for next Tuesday's session is open already. Back on the on the J Learning page, same one you would have registered for this one. Uh, and the presenter next Tuesday is Dr. Julia Walsh who's a senior academic working in Latrobe University in Melbourne. Her research interests are specific to coaching and coach education. She's head coach of the Australian Boomerangs, uh, which is an Australian men's basketball team for athletes with intellectual disability. And she also coaches high performance junior girls in Victorian basketball, uh, in the Victorian Junior Basketball League. So Julia is from uh, Australia, as, as I said, um, but was over here in Ireland for a number of years and she worked in UCC setting up the physical education and sports studies program down there until she went back uh, back home to Australia. She has some really interesting insights that, that she brings to Gaelic games from, from her experiences in basketball and, and, and other sports. So uh, it's, 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 a really, it's a really interesting session. It's going to be very, very good next Tuesday night. So again, thanks to James and thanks to Anya for everything for, for this session.
we wish you all a, a happy and a safe bank holiday weekend and hopefully we'll see you all back here again next Tuesday evening. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter.